Hello, I'm Shelly Rothis, and I'm a different kind of victim. Today, we're going to be going over part one, and I'll be describing it in more detail as to giving a better understanding. Also, showing how it relates to all three types of abuse that I've been using for my <clears throat> way of teaching based upon abuse and how it is similar in the patterns no matter what type of abuse, where it happens, or who it happens by. So, the part one that I had recently gone over is what I now call from trauma bonds to asaholics toxic pity party addiction. So, I had gone over in part one is based upon the pity party. A pity party, most people think it's based upon, you know, somebody having, like, an example would be saying that they're sick, even though they're not really that sick, or they're even lying about it. There's people actually lie and say that they have this or that, or they're sick, because they enjoy what? The attention. Yes. So it's about attention and also accepting that behavior and getting others to believe the lies or you know, they're, they're little fibs, you know, even if they are a little bit sick, they, they enjoy that attention. They enjoy that acceptance of doing so. So what does that do? That makes that person continue that behavior. The same thing applies to those who choose to use abusive behaviors. So when we make excuses and exceptions, for people who choose to use abusive behaviors on others to harm them, we're doing the same exact thing. We're making that cycle of abuse continue to go round and round. So that's why I changed it because trauma, when we think of that, as I stated, we think of people that have had harm done to them. So what are we doing? We are bypassing what they are doing. Here's the abuse that they're doing, but you know, we're, we're focusing on, Oh, they, they were abused too. Um, they, they had a hard life. Oh my God. No. And that goes back to where I stated <clears throat> that it's actually offensive to victims, the many victims that were also abused or had hard times in their life that never did what their abusers or those people did to harm them to others or actually see it as being wrong and never wanting to harm others the same way that they were harmed. And that's exactly where I'm at. Is Even as a young kid, I still remember being very <clears throat> passionate about helping others and being good to others and just having a big heart. That's just how I was. And I've also mentioned in past videos is that we learn ourselves without those that raised us how we want to be in life based upon how we treat others, our beliefs and opinions about many things out there, comes from outside of those who raised us. So I'm going to get to the meaning stage and helping understand that. Now, the meaning stage I had used, there's the asaholic and then there's the target. So what makes up a target? So. I've learned that many sexual assaults are planned out and the way that they first do it, the sexual offender, they'll pick out a victim that seems vulnerable. So what makes a target vulnerable in the eyes of an assaholic? That would be somebody who's had many problems, many traumatic experiences. So let's, let's point the fingers at me as many you know, have read my story or known what I've have gone through, they're like, wow, you know, even more so than what I myself realized. <clears throat> but I guess I have gone through quite a bit more than what most others have gone through. So what makes me vulnerable? It's also because I have a big heart. Like my friend Karen even stated, you know, you have a big heart, so you're an easy target. We're both emotional. You know, that also makes me an easy target. 
those are the big heart. They have emotions. That's what they're known for. And they actually care about how they affect others. And they don't want to hurt others. I've never wanted to hurt others and see others go through the same pains that I have gone through based on my personal experiences that harmed me. So the assaholic sees that. What do they see? They see somebody that didn't get what most people, well, I, should, I would say most people, almost everybody would want in their life. And that's to feel accepted, loved, cared about. So when somebody didn't receive that much of that, you know, that's a perfect target. Like, oh, they didn't get that, that, that. So you know what? They're an easy target. I'm going to manipulate them to think that I actually care about them and be what they never had. And that will be my way of reeling them in. Just like in a, a sexual offender, that's how they gain the trust of their victim. They're going to be like, oh, I'm going to give them love. I'm going to show them fake love you know, fake friendship, care, you know, all of that. So that victim, of course, it's easier for them. They're going to be like, wow, these feelings, you know, I didn't have them before. They feel so good. You know, this person is great. So that's how they reel them in. That's exactly what happens in what I now call from trauma bonds to the asaholics toxic pity party addiction. <clears throat> and that's basically the pity party part two of it too is that that victim, you know, they're getting that from the assaholic is, you know, a pity party because it's fake. That assaholic doesn't care about the target. Their goal is to get that target under their power and control so that they can use them for whose benefit? Not the target's benefit, but the assaholic's benefit. They're going to be the ones benefiting off of that target. Because what happened with that is with my father, I'll use as the example. Like I had read about in part one is that my father came from a family of six children with him being the oldest and having a mother and father and his father passed away before my dad was of age, which would be 18 as an adult. He was the oldest of six siblings. So <clears throat> his mother was left to raise six children on her own. So now this is where social and cultural norms will come in play as to where it's hypocritical. So what is that? People will shame a parent so easily if they neglect or abuse their children. They're like, it's your responsibility and there's no excuses or exceptions for it. Take care of your children, period. But what about abusers? Why are we making excuses and exceptions for abusers? The same would apply to what, how it would negatively affect parenting and what parents get away with and making that abuse worse. So if we sit there and make lame excuses and exceptions for parents and treating their children badly, such as abuse or neglect, when they can actually not do so and they're doing it on purpose based on, upon their own selfish needs, what's going to happen if we keep giving them excuses and exceptions? They're going to continue that pattern and it's going to get worse. They're going to be like, oh, I'm getting away with this. You know, people are accepting it. They're feeling sorry for me. So, you know what? Yeah, this behavior is good. You know, I'm, I'm getting all the benefits. So I'm going to continue that cycle. That's exactly what happens in any type of abuse. So when we make any excuses or exceptions for bad behavior, no matter how small, it will get worse. Such as, you know, when Ken in the bullying incident is that he got worse and worse, as I stated. And that's because he got the support. He got the, you know, the pity party, you know, like, yeah, she was a really bad friend. You know, even though I wasn't the bad friend, it was actually Ken who was the bad friend. Because he went along with watching me get harmed being the onlooker to being the follower to engaging it in somewhat and supporting it to being a cult clan member where he went through all the plans to harm me. And worst of all, you know, he pretended to be my friend while doing so. 
So that made that relationship even more toxic for me because he basically used me and pretended to be my friend. Just like in any you know type of abuse, which I'm talking about now, the target, that rock that they you know feel that assaholic is, is actually fake. It's not real. Just like Ken was not real for me. It was more toxic and was only benefiting him while he was engaging in abusive things that were being done to me. So when my mother met my father, he would be, you know, the perfect target because of his past. So, you know, she, she's going to make up for what he didn't get in his life, you know, and be that rock for him. But it's actually a toxic rock, as I've just shown, even with the online bullying incidents as to what Ken was in for me. So she reeled my father in, you know, even with food, you know, cooking him food and this and that, because that's where he was neglected. His mother didn't, you know, provide much food for the children. And, you know, she would actually use that against them and shame them for, you know, having to do all that for them, you know, because she was on her own taking care of such six children. But you know what? It wasn't the children's fault that she was in that situation and they should have never been blamed for it or abused for that. That is not an excuse or an exception. Just like it carried on to my father where he did the same to me. He ended up being the target and that was the meeting stage with my mother. And then it all started from there in the bonding as to where he felt like he had somebody finally giving him the feelings that he never experienced before. But it's all fake because that's exactly how the assaholic reels in their targets, is making them feel like they're wanted, they're loved, they're cared for. But it's really not real. So that goes to respect, being real. And an assaholic is definitely not real. So the bonding stage, and that's when they start reeling them in into doing what they want, which is abusive behaviors. My mother started that out by attacking my father's family and taking him away from them as to making him believe that they are bad for him and that he needs to follow her. Ooh, follow her. Now, where did that come on? Ooh, social and cultural norms. Oh my goodness. Marriage. Till death do you part. That's right. That's where another flaw is, you know, marriage. Till death do you part no matter what. And my father followed that because I'll give an example. I'll go a little bit off topic here. In the current situation with Grumpster, what was one thing that he said that was just like my father? Whenever an abuse situation would happen to me, my father's excuse and exception for either watching the abuse happen to me or even engaging in it would be, well, Shelly, she's my wife. Or she's your mother. That should be an excuse for them abusing me? An exception? Absolutely not doesn't matter what status that person has in your life. So how did Grumpster do the same thing recently? So Asuka, which is the assaholic in this situation when it comes to the topic I'm going over, and Grumpster being her target, he had actually told me, he said, that's my best friend, defended her abuse that she had done to me and his. Yes, because that's how he was taught and how he learned based upon what she wants him to do. So, <laughs> like I said, it was like being with my mother and father when it came to Grumpster and Asuka. Even though it's not the same type of relationship, but trauma bonds is what they knew it before, is before I changed it, is that it could happen in any type of relationship, even a friendship. So... Now back to the bonding stage. 
Now, my father was the onlooker watching me as a young child get abused by my mother and sister. So he was mainly an onlooker at the beginning. And then as time went on, right before I was a teenager, he became a follower and very quickly became a cult clan member and engaged in it without any help of them guiding him as to how to do the abuse. So now we're going to go back to the online. So as I stated is that Ken was an onlooker at first and then he became a follower and then a cult clan member. So now we are going to go to, you know, making excuses and exceptions. The victim does it themselves. Like I stated is, you know, I felt bad that Ken was going through all that stress as to me being attacked and bullied and abused like that and harmed. But should I be giving him excuses and exceptions? No, absolutely not. Should I be blaming myself for that, you know, happening to him that he got stressed? Absolutely not. That is not my fault. But you know what? I did blame myself. I did feel guilty. I did shame myself as though I was the bad friend, even though all along it was him that ruined the relationship and was a bad person to me. So that wasn't even a friend. Like I had discussed is that I even spoke to John Paul and he's like, Shelly, he was in a hate group. That is not a friend. Absolutely true. Just like my father being going along and staying with my mother and sister, you know, based on, like I said, social and cultural norms, you know, he needs to stay with his wife till death do him part. But he also watched that wife abuse his child. So the social and cultural norms, they make out the wife. It also deals with, you know, the gender. They go by, you know, the man needs, it's his duty for life after getting marry, married to care for that spouse, his wife, till death do him part. Meaning financially, going along with what she wants, pleasing her, blah, blah, blah. We try to say all the time that, you know, females have it equal now in the relationship and blah, blah, blah. But that's total BS in many cases. Many still go by the old ways that the man is obligated, no matter what happens, to stay with his wife till death do him part that he cares for her, he goes by what she wants to please her. Like she's some queen that he has to bow down to and he's just the slave. That's exactly what the relationship is like with my mother and father. Because that's why he was the perfect target for my mother and she knew he would follow along with her abuse. And, well, I shouldn't say knew. My dad actually had the choice to continue that relationship. And that's exactly what he did. So that's where I came up with my new boundary is even after I escaped, I still only blamed my mother and sister for ruining the relationship with my father. And that was my first boundary as I had stated, which was that I'm not going to be friends with anybody that interferes with a relationship that means something to me that's special, sentimental, that I had value with, and they, you know, and I was close to that person. No. So even that person who was that, that engaged in it, I now see that just as bad. My father had the choice to do those things. So that's a new boundary. I don't need somebody like that in my life. I don't need my father in my life. I realize that he is that. Even though I want that, and those feelings in between make it hard, made it extremely hard for me to come to, yes, he is that. You know, I may want this, but my needs are more important. And I won't have a healthy relationship unless my father chooses to make the changes that are necessary in order to have that with me. The same applies with my current situation and the online. So 
Would it work out like let's use Ken? Would it work out if we became friends again now? While he's still in that bullying cult clan and associates with the people that have harmed me? Absolutely not. Just like with the current situation with Asuka and Grumster, would it work out? No, because that abuse pattern is going to continue just like it would with my father because he's still with my mother and she's still going to want that abuse to happen and he's still going to go by what she wants. So he's already in the stage as Grumpster and Ken are, which I called the conditioned, normalized assholeism syndrome. And they're already in that stage. So my father, Ken, and Grumpster are already in that stage. So am I able to change that? You know, would I be able to be in a relationship with the three, any three of those people in my life? No, because right now they are under, under the power control of Ken being under the cult clan leader and the other cult clan members and abiding by the rules of them because what? They are his rock. In Ken's case, it's a little bit complicated and understanding why does he stay? Well, it's just easier to be an asshole. Plus, it gives the feeling of being needed and wanted. And that's something that even most humans want too. They want to feel like they're needed and wanted and even, you know, cared about. Even though I had just proven is that it's all fake because it's not benefiting that person. It's actually benefiting, you know, the people that they're doing it for that enjoy doing those abusive behaviors. So that's not real care. That's not love. That's not respect. So even those cult clan members that engage in those abusive behaviors, that's not what you would consider being cared about and being respected because they're all using each other to go through with those abusive behaviors that harms others. You can sit there and say it all you want that, yeah, they're my friends, you know, they care about me, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But all in all, you know, the way I look at it now and realize is that it was Ken that was the bad friend. He actually lost out on somebody that actually respected and trusted him. Just like my father is losing out because he's in a relationship that is fake. You know, he's, he chose that and I can't do anything about it. But he lost somebody that actually did care and respect him for who he is and wanted to actually benefit him in positive ways in his life and have him have happiness that's actually based on real things, which is real love and care, unlike what my mother and sister give to him. Same with Grumster and Asuka. Even though that was a newer relationship, I see that as understanding, at least this time I realized it, is that it was his loss. He's, you know, I actually felt sorry for him too, just like I did with Ken, that he's under the wrath of Asuka. But again, just like with Ken choosing to stay in that bullying cult clan and remain friends with people that he watched harm somebody that didn't deserve it, is the same thing with Asuka and Grumpster. Grumpster sat there and watched Asuka threaten me and also demean and degrade me and also try to control me. So with that, that's where the problem lied is that Asuka tried to get me into that. So let's go to that situation. How did I start seeing that? Just the way that Asuka was with Grumpster. So one thing is when Grumpster described Asuka to me, I was like, you know, wow, she doesn't sound all that great. She was actually messing around with her, you know, best friend's newly ex-husband. And I'm like, wow. I was like, she doesn't sound all that great. And then, you know, Grumpster was already talking about her, like saying, yeah, she's my best friend. You know, she has my heart, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, just like I said, that fake, you know, rock, you know, Jessica Asica, <laughs> uh, I'll use the name Asica, um, 
made Grumpster feel like, you know, yeah, you didn't get the love and the care and that rock that's going to stay in your life. So I had described Grumpster's life. He came from a large family too. You know, he had bad experiences such as, you know, a wife of 35 years that just took off unexpectedly. So when he met Asuka, it was like, you know, she's making up for that, you know. He's not close to other family members and doesn't have anybody else in his life that's a solid rock. So Asuka saw that as the target. You know, I'm going to say manipulate him to believe that I'll be his rock. But she wanted power and control over him as to what he's allowed to do and everything. But she keeps him thinking that she's that solid rock when all along it's only benefiting her and not him. So when another thing that was kind of odd to me is when I was with her alone, Asuka, she even told me that with Grumpster's previous relationship that he dated somebody else after his wife left him, they were together for a couple years and that's when he met Asuka while he was dating her and she was dating somebody else. She had told me that after those relationships ended, well, not um, his with that person, but hers, is that her deal with his girlfriend at that time was that his girlfriend is responsible as for Rumpster's needs is to, you know, the way she put it all, say the naughty word is to fuck him. And Asuka said her job was to take care of him, like make him meals, clean his place, you know, bring him coffee, you know, take care of his emotional needs. But his girlfriend's job was to just have sex with him. Yeah, that's how she put it to me. She also mentioned something that I didn't know about, I would never do, but I didn't realize is she wanted to be a triangle with me. I was like, okay, so I'm thinking she meant just like friends, you know, the three of us being friends, not involving, you know, a relationship as an intimate partnership. But from what I learned afterwards is that's exactly what she wanted with me, meaning she would be basically in a relationship, that, you know, an intimate partnership with me and Grumpster. Mm, no, I don't think so. Never. So... She tried to start controlling me, bossing me around, and that's where she got mad and went further in the abuse. So, just like with the situation with my three assaholics, as for my mother and father, when I didn't follow that abuse, she knew who to attack. She went after my father. Like I stated, even with the situation with the online bullying incidents, they knew who to attack and go after in order to get me to, or try to get me to obey their commands and control over me. They went after Ken, just like now. Asuka went after Rumpster and got him in order to attack me and punish me for not following her control, just like with Ken. They went after him because I was going to follow their control and abuse on me, just like with my father and mother. My mother attacked my father and got him to go against me. As you see, the three types of abuse that are different, that many see as completely <clears throat> different, all have that same pattern of abuse as to how it continues and how it works as for patterns. Very similar and exactly, basically the same exact thing. So, the conditioned, normalized assholeism syndrome, that would be my father, Ken, and Grumpster, normalizing those behaviors of abuse that they do on the victims that their cult leader, the ones that made them a target, want them to do. Also, where it becomes so normalized, that they continue those patterns of abuse without even being told to do them. 
and guided to do them. So it becomes a regular pattern for them too. And that's where I come to back to is, do I just blame the assaholic that made them that target that they ended up following? No, I have to blame that person that was the target that chose, chose to do those abusive behaviors on me. Just like I realized now is that what happened with me and Ken is all his fault. And there's no excuses or exceptions for the behaviors that he chose that were abusive and that he did to me. Same with my father. I'm not going to just say, you know, my mother and sister are at fault for my dad becoming abusive towards me. And he made that choice to continue and be abusive towards me. Same with Grumpster. He chose Asuka over me and engaged in a, the abusive behaviors done towards me. So, and now we're going to go to where do I want those people back in my life? There's the want and the need. I can't make that choice. You know, the feelings in between is I wish I could, you know, I wish, you know, I miss certain things. There's the wants of what I miss about those relationships, but what do I need? I have to focus on what I need and I can't have what I need if those people that were the targets in that situation don't change their behaviors. There's no point of having that relationship. I made that you know, decision. And I discussed that, that actually came to where I, you know, realized that was with my friend Karen d when discussing my situation with Grumpster and Asica. You know, I said, you know what? I can't have a relationship with him that would be healthy and it wouldn't be worth it if Asica is still in the picture because just her, you know, I mean, heck, I even thought, you know, well, maybe I could, you know, he, it's not about me not wanting him, you know, trying to control who he's friends with. But, heck, I would be like, you know, well, it would be great if we had a relationship and, you know, she didn't even know about it. That it was like undercover and secret. You know, that that's the same as I thought with Ken. I was thinking, you know, well, maybe if none of those cult clan members, that's exactly what I did. If they didn't know that me and him are talking, he wouldn't get, you know abusive towards me. It would prevent that from happening. But look what happened. They still reeled him in, found out that we're still talking, and he went along with it. So my idea of keeping the relationship undercover and not known, <laughs> that wouldn't work either. That's how good uh, assaholics are as for lying and finding things out about their target or victim. So I had to come to the exception that that wouldn't work either. Even if I kept those relationships undercover, it's still not good for me. And it's not fair to me that I would have to do that because the people that should be making the changes would have been in those two situations would be Ken and Grumpster. They would have to make the decision as to who they want a relationship with. And in Ken's situation he chose to stay with those that were harming me and abusing me over me because he ended up unfriending me and blocking me totally and going along with the lies and treating me like I was the bad person in that relationship as though I was the one that was harmful and all of that that's exactly what they put on to me when in actuality I was not at fault for that happening I'm not at fault for the bad things that happened to me I didn't do any harm against them like they made it out to be. Just like with the current situation, I was blamed, shamed, and bullied by many people. Even people I didn't even know were believing lies based upon what happened and spreading them and giving me dirty looks and bullying me. I got stalked. I got spit on. All of that. Yes, the victim ends up suffering even more and I didn't believe this when I learned about it but it's very true that most people will go along with the abuser you know like I stated is that you know most people wouldn't think my father is abusive based upon his personality 
The same applies to Grumpster. Nobody would ever believe that he had that in him. It's very hard for me to believe. You know, if I look at my father and Grumpster, it's like, you know, wow, I'm still spellbound. Like, how is that possible? You know, especially with Grumpster. Grumpster was a very calm person. You know, never yelled at me or laid a hand on me. You know, my father did have that, you know, hidden temper and the way he acted and stuff like that. But out in public, he was seen as very calm, very intelligent, very kind, caring. But behind those closed doors, let's just say things can change very easily. With Grumpster, it was a lot more, you know, hard to see because even when it was just me and him alone, he was a very calm, caring person. But I noticed the change when he was around Asaka. That's where I could see it. I was like, you know, wow. And the way he spoke to me, just like with Ken. Even if, you know, because one person brought this up, like, yeah, there, you know, when we're in that PM group with all the others, the way he talked was differently. But guess what? He talked differently, differently to me, too, when it was just me and him talking, when he was engaging with that bullying cult clan. He changed the way he talked when it was just me and him. Most people would think, you know, like recently, somebody had said that to me, said, yeah, well, he's around the guys, you know, he's going to talk differently. Well, you know what? He started talking differently to me when it was just me and him in private message talking when he was engaging more with the bullying cult clan and was under the wrath. So, you know, and that's another thing is that people should realize that their relationship with somebody is not going to be the same as somebody else had it with them. So you can't just judge based upon what you know of that person and your relationship with them. You can't, you know, it would be like me judging my relationship and, you know, with Grumpster and his past relationships. Totally different. What they experienced and what I experienced, I'm not going to sit there and say, judge upon them as to what I think they had. That same goes for a friendship. Don't sit there and judge what I had with my friendship with Ken based upon what you went through. It's not going to be the same thing as to what happened to me and what you had with that person. Same with, you know, Grumpster and all his past relationships. So, I wanted to go over based upon what I had already explained as for the stages of Asaholic's toxic pity party <laughs> and what that means as for the pity party part of that and what the, it's an addiction as to how that person craves that, you know, attention, also the acceptance of those toxic behaviors that they do that are lies and how, why I changed it from trauma bonds to that because of that reason, because they shouldn't get a pity party. They shouldn't be felt sorry for. We need to, what, take responsibility for our chosen behaviors and actions. It's not in our head that we're an abuser, that it's a brain disorder. So we need to stick to the facts and also focus on the victim. So what abuse cycle doesn't continue to get worse and worse and also continue to happen and be able to do so by doing that. Because giving excuses and exceptions puts it back to the victim as though it's their fault and that's where the focus will end up going. So we also need to stop discriminating against the different types of abuses as to who's doing it and where it happens and whatnot. Because what does that do? That also enables, encourages, and enables it when they do that because it enables the abuse to continue by minimizing other types of abuse. So that makes all of it get worse and worse. So we need to stop the discrimination based upon what that victim 
and what kind of abuse they went through, what type, and who it happened from. So I really hope to make changes within domestic violence culture as to helping current and future victims so that they can actually get the help that they need and hopefully, I know it'll take ages just like Paul J. Kaplan had stated years ago, is that you know hopefully things will change so that things will get better. So we're going to be looking back at what I'm discussing now just like we do when slavery became illegal. We're going to be looking back and saying, wow, those people did that and that and that. You know, what assholes. That's exactly where we're going to be many ages from now looking back at all the things that I'm discussing just like we do with slavery. It's really sad that people don't see it now. Most people don't. But that's exactly what it's going to be like in ages when this family gets fixed and things change. So the next part is going to be part two of what I've changed from trauma bonds to assaholics, toxic pity party addiction. So I hope to see you for the next part two. I'm Shelly Rothis and I'm a different kind of victim. See you next time.